wishes and prayers that mean a lot, a lot, a lot to me. Okay, I think I'm good to go. So last week we started a journey understanding the uh, understanding the book of Ephesians. You know, I laid the foundation last week, and this week I want to continue uh, from verse one where I stopped. Right. So in case you are just watching or just joining us, uh, we've had um, a family. You know, f- you know the church family has, has spoken into my life, blessed me tremendously this morning. Uh, so. In case you were thinking, oh, Pastor, this message is short today. We, we have a family time together. We, we the, the Transmas Church is not uh, an online church in the sense that what you see online on Sundays is what we do. We have a full service, prayer, worship, getting together before my teaching and after my teaching. So in the meantime, until we, we enter into the next phase that God is leading us, uh, we just want to, I just want to say that, you know, we have a proper church service um, and we also have home church, right? We have a proper service outside of what you see on social, on social or you hear on podcasts and things like that. Amen. I hope that blesses someone. I believe it's a word for someone. So I want to continue from where I stopped last week, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, and I was talking about Paul. So Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 reads, uh, you know, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. And I, I emphasized that, last week I stated that, you know, Paul, you know, clearly emphasized that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, which means he did not call himself, right? And it says this by the will of God. And I try to help us understand that it's important that we identify what God has called us to do and give ourselves to it. Because it is in identifying what God has called you to do and giving yourself to it that you'll be able to experience the anointing and the authority that comes with that assignment. Now, don't allow yourself to be carried away or enticed by the ministry gift or ministry talent of other people. The Bible clearly makes us to understand that we are a body of Christ and each one of us are different units. If when we and if we play our part correctly, right, we will benefit one another. Imagine each all of us wants to be a pastor. So who's going to be the prophet? Who's going to be the apostle? Who's going to be the you know uh, evangelist? So, but all of this ministry gift and many other ministry gifts, right, uh, is the leadership. All of this build up the body of Christ and enable us, empower us to be a blessing to the world. Praise God. So try to recognize your own gifting. And uh, focus on it, you know, pray, spend time, you know, try to understand how you can function well in your assignment. Amen. You can only be good at very few things, not in many, many things. If you want to avoid jealousy and envy in your life, focus on who God calls you or who God calls you to be and what he has called you to do. And just trust him. Just trust him all the way. He's going he's gonna to see you through. Now, don't try to measure success the way the world measures success. The world's measure of success to a very much extent is based on size, based on size, how much money you have, and many other things. But I can tell you, many of these very rich people in the world are so unhappy. Many of them are hooked on drugs because there's a void and emptiness in their heart. So to you, you see them to be successful, but if we're to look at things from the point of God, these people are wreck, right? They are, they are wreck in a sense, if that's how to put it. So, I mean, they are, they're not in a good place at all. The Bible tells us that God wants you and I to be prosperous in our spirit, in our soul, and in our mind, if I'm correct, right? So, I wish above all things that you may prosper even in health. Yeah, is it health? I can't remember, I can't remember how... As your, even as your soul prospereth. So if you are, I love this. So if you're financially prosperous and your soul is full of all manner of death and junk and evil, you are not prosperous, you're not successful. I saw a video on YouTube and the young man who used to peddle drugs, who is now repentant, said, many of the rich people you know in the city who claim they are into real estate, he said many of them are into cooking business. And they are the sponsors of our leaders in uh, drug peddling. But he didn't mention names. 
So you go to parties, you go to you go to parties, you, you go and meet a lot of rich people, but you don't know that over twenty percent of these people are in wicked works because their soul is so bad. They have the money, but their soul is so engrossed in darkness. So do you say such man is prosperous? No. So mind how you define success. I also want to bless you with this. Mind the company you keep because the company, the definition of success by the company you keep will influence how you define success. I had to cut off from many people, a number of people, not too many, a number of people who were defining ministry success by numbers, how much building you have, who have no regard for the human lives, the people that come into your church. It's only a matter of time. If I, keep, if I keep company with these people, it will begin to distort my view and perspective of, ministry, of ministerial success. Amen. So the Bible tells us that 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, evil companionship, evil communication, evil company with corrupt good manners. See, you can't beat the truth of the Bible. So if the Bible says, don't keep company with stupid, foolish, unintelligent, evil people. Please don't keep company with them. Praise the Lord. So, still in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, most of the time, people, believe, people think or interpret the word saint as someone who is holy based on their actions. So people will call a person a saint because they have given themselves to priesthood. They've given themselves to, to be a nun, right? So people who don't marry, people who don't, you know, more of this kind of Catholic priest. I'm not trying to throw stone or to say something negative about, uh, you know, this, these things that came out of this Catholic um, issues like human exploitation, sexual abuse, and things like that. I'm not trying to expose the church or make or run negative comment about it. There are negative things too, but what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to condemn people. But that tells us that the fact that a person looks holy does not mean they are holy. And does not mean that their soul is prosperous. So a saint is not a saint based on what they do. Or how they appear. The first, uh, the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians is focused on our position in Christ Jesus. The first three chapters. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just about to repeat myself, but let me let me carry on. So, chapter one here, verse one here. When Paul called the guys in the Ephesus saints, it was that was that is based on their position in Christ. So a saint is a, person, is a, a saint is a holy person. Right? A saint is a holy person. But most of the time, Christians want to declare themselves holy based on what they do, but not based on who they are in Christ Jesus. Many people want to act in a way that is... In, many people don't understand that. You cannot consistently act in a way that is inconsistent with how you see yourself or inconsistent with who you truly are. Now, because if in your heart of heart, you don't see yourself as a holy person, you cannot consistently act holy. So holiness is first a thing of the heart, the regeneration. You, the, regeneration the regeneration of our spirit, I mean being born again, until you are born again, until you have the nature, the holy nature of Christ, until, the, until, your, until your human spirit is re recreated. You cannot live consistently a holy life. Because the nature of the devil in people who are unsaved cannot consistently produce righteousness, holiness. So the starting point for any, anyone who wants to live a holy life is to be holy by position in Christ Jesus. And that is by giving your life to Christ. We're still on verse 1. I'm, kind, I'm trying to help us to learn how to read the Bible in context, you know, and to also to read line by line. You know, one person that God used in my life to, you know, to be able to explore the Bible this way is a uh, Kenahi again, who's going on to be with the Lord now. You know, it surprised me how Papa Egin would go through the verses of the Bible and exploit, you know, take a word 
expand on it. And I'm thinking, mate, I've been reading this verse for a long time. I, I didn't realize how much is loaded in it. Amen. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus. So don't think that you need to act holy for God to consider you holy. You are holy because you are in Christ Jesus. You're, you are spiritually, you are holy. And your holiness is not based on you as a person, but your position in Christ Jesus. And that's the starting point of any journey into holiness. You know, I said earlier on, you know, based on quotes here and there, you cannot consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with how you see yourself. If you don't see yourself to be genuinely holy, born again, righteous, you cannot act accordingly. Hence, some people are struggling with sin because they don't believe. They are not convinced. Their heart is not assured that they are holy. Excuse me. <clears throat> and he said, faithful in Christ Jesus. So why did Paul mention or specify faithful in Christ Jesus? It kind of tells us that even among the saints, they are faithful and they are unfaithful ones. So are you faithful? Are you a lawyer? Are you committed? So this letter, in a sense, is written to the church of the church, the church in the church, the faithful ones in the church, among the saints. So the fact that you are a saint, you are holy, does not mean that you necessarily commit yourself to following Christ. But the people that will transform the world, the people that will change lives, are the faithful among the saints who have committed themselves to following Christ and to becoming who God has created them to be. Just, that's just verse 1. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you take your time, you notice that grace always comes before peace. Galatians, uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 7, Paul, you, the Bible says grace and peace. Galatians 1 3, grace and peace. Uh, Philippians 1, two, grace and peace. Where's my mobile phone? I have my mobile phone there to read uh, a Bible verse. Okay, I have one here. Okay, let's take one of them. Romans 1 7. Let's read. Romans 1 7. Paul said, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Galatians 1 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Why did Paul put grace before peace? What is grace? Grace is the undeserved kindness of God expressed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, the works of Christ Jesus. Grace is God loving you unconditionally, not based on your efforts, but based on his own kindness towards you. Now, God doesn't want you to be good for him to love you. Hum, you know, it is a human beings that we need to have some level, we, we need to be good to a certain extent for people to love us. And that's on platonic relationships. I'm not looking at father, mother, term, father, mother, child, parents relationship. But generally speaking, to, a, to, a, to, a, to an extent, you need to be, you know, be a decent person for people to kind of really love you. Now, people can also love you, but also learn to manage their relationship with you because you can run them mad. <laughs> Amen. And, and that, should not be our, that should not be our status, our position, or our disposition towards life and people. Right? We should be on the giving end. Praise God. We should be on the giving end. We should be the one blessing people, not running people crazy. Praise the Lord. So, grace always comes before peace. Now, many people are trying to secure a peaceful relationship with God. They, they want to have a joyful relationship with God without grace. They want to have a, a peaceful relationship with God on the basis of their own human effort. The question is, how is that working for them? Even many of us who understand, who have come across the gospel of grace, which is the gospel of Christ, we're still struggling to believe, to consistently believe that God loves us unconditionally. How much more people who want to and God wants to have a peaceful relationship based on their human effort. They will always run into problem. They will always run into, into confusion. You know why? Because you can't do enough. You will never be able to do enough for you to feel satisfied that God loves you. Because the moment you feel you have done enough, right? The moment you feel you have done enough, then you come across someone who, who, who will outperform you. And then the devil will always play games on your mind, telling you you need to do more. 
Amen. So grace must always come before peace. So if you want to experience peace in your walk with God, you need to invest in understanding the grace of God. You need to understand. You need to have the revelation understanding that God loves you unconditionally. God is not angry at you. The Bible says that while you were yet sinners, before you gave your life to Christ, before you even have a positive or reasonable response to Christ, God loved you. John 3, 16, the Bible reads, uh, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loves you unconditionally. And God, did, Jesus said, he did not come for the healthy. He didn't come for people who, who are good in their own eyes. He came for people, to, he came to die for people who know they need God. Amen. Who believe they need God? And if you look at the stories of people who went to Jesus, there was condemnation in their hearts in one way or the other. I mean, people were trying to prove their being good to Christ. I think as a young, a rich, young ruler, you know, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. And Jesus said, give away your money, give away your, your wealth. Then the guy, the guy ran into depression. <laughs> Amen. There's nothing you can do in this world that be, can be sufficient enough to make to to satisfy you from the inside that you can to 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 satisfy you from the inside that you can have a peaceful relationship with God nothing try it nothing and that's why when you mess up all you need is to fess up admit you were wrong and ask God for help now one of the people categories of people that I know um, struggle hard, the hardest when they mess up in their Christian work are people who have a performance-based relationship with God. They go to church, clean the church for God to bless them. One day, due to rain or snow or something, they were not able to get to church. Condemnation nearly runs these people mad because they just believe God will be hungry. Did you think that God did not see that rain was falling? And they, they will start explaining to God and their pastor. I know God understands. God knows that it was the rain. It was the snow. Let me say the right order of things as Christians is this. We don't do for God to bless us. We do because we believe God has blessed us and God has enabled us. So we live out our Christian nature. We live out our Christian life. We live out the, Christ, we live out the nature of God in us. We don't, um, we don't try to copy the nature of God. For God to love us. Am I making any sense? So you first receive the new life in Christ Jesus and you act nice, you act good because you are a Christian. Because you are a child of God. You don't act good, you don't act good and nice so that you can be a child of God. It does not work that way. And what I've just shared in the past two, three minutes, if anyone gets it clearly that way, I can guarantee they will experience an unprecedented level of peace with God. I'm telling you, test is tested and tried. I thought I've been doing this for 20 years. I've done a lot of counseling. I've dealt with many and different kind of people. So whatever I'm telling you right now, Lord, shall I use that joke? It's legitimate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? My wife understand that. It's, it's legitimate. <laughs> because I don't want to give it all out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So people don't think, Pastor... <laughs> Is that what you do when you're supposed to read your Bible? <laughs> All right, you know, you know, so we are we are we are we are diverse, we are you know, we're multicultural, you know, understand? So <laughs> praise God. So the Bible says, having been justified by by faith, we have peace with God. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So justification is what brings about our peace, but that's spiritually. Righteous. So before you can have peace with God, before you can ex before you can have peace with God, you need to be declared righteous, and that, which is what justification means. But this is something that God has done for you spiritually. But until you receive it, you cannot experience it. So it takes faith in the justification or declaration of righteousness of you, based on what Christ have done to enable you to actually experience the peace that God has given to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, 2 Peter 1-2 says, 
you know, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So if you want to experience the, if you want to experience the peace of God much more and experience the grace of God much more, you need to give yourself to studying, understanding, thinking, spending as much time as possible meditating, having converse, meditating on it and having conversations with people who believe the word of God. You got to be careful the kind of churches you go to, the kind of pastors you listen to. Why are you shocked? Why are you surprised when you hear a pastor who says people will go to hell because they are sinning or you, or you better be careful because, this is, what is an example of what they say, you better be careful because you don't know when Jesus will return and you may not make it. You know, have you not, why does it surprise you that many of such pastors and, or people in those ministries are wallowing in sin? Why does it surprise you? And why are you not asking questions? Because you can't, <laughs> see, God does not need your human help to help people succeed, to help people live a, a, a peaceful, a successful Christian life. No, God doesn't need human help. And when I say human help, what I mean is this. God does not need a human to put fear in people to make people stay away from sin. He knows what people need. See, God knows us better. God knows the human being. God created us. So if God is saying that your knowledge of your position in Christ Jesus is what will help you to overcome sin, let pastors and preachers do that. Because many, because, okay, how do you, how do you define sin? People say things like gay, yeah, gay, um, gays will go to hell. I'm like, seriously, you want, you want, you want to hear the true gospel? You want to hear the true gospel? Right. So a lesbian, a gay person who is born again, right? And a person who is born again but committing adultery. So which one will make hell? Which one will not go to, which one will make heaven? Which one will make hell? Because before God, sin is sin. But sin manifests in different form in people's lives. So if someone is saying, well, I'm struggling with this problem, then we should look at, think about how do we help them. And you don't know people's story. Right? You don't know what you don't know people's story. And I don't want to go into details. You don't know people's story. So believers should learn to deal with people as an individual as opposed to stereotyping, castigating. No, these are not like Christ. Amen. This, this is not what Christ taught us. We have not so learned Christ. Praise God. So grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our Lord. Uh, uh, from God. Okay, sorry, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace always comes before peace. Right. Be mindful of churches you go. Be mindful of people you listen to. God has established a framework. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. Practice it. Act accordingly, and you will automatically not commit sin. See, this is legitimate. Praise the Lord. It is, I mean, it's, it's tried, tested, proven. And that's from a human point of view. You are much more God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and, and the Father. Sorry, this is my how I read it fast when I'm reading. So let me read it as it is in the Bible for you guys. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Who has blessed us? So people often say things like, do this so that God can bless you. Give this kind of money so that God can bless you. The question number one is, okay, well, how do you define blessing? Because many people in the world who don't believe in Christ, who are non-religious in their mind, according to their definition, who don't believe in Christianity, have many of the things that he, Christians call blessing. So if we go to church to be blessed, and, the ble and what we call blessing is money, we have something is wrong with our definition. Be <laughs> Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, <laughs> blessing in Christ Jesus? So there was something missing in that definition of perspective of blessing. Watch this. It's a spiritual blessing. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. No physical, material blessing. Because every physical thing we see in our world today has its roots in the spiritual things. 
everything in the world, God cre- everything physical in the world, God created by speaking the word. Everything physical in this world came out of the spiritual, came out of the realm of the spirit, came out of non-existence to existence. So when God was creating the world, cre- creating people, was there dollar in then? Was there pounds? Do you know these money currencies are things that are designed by human beings? The money system was designed by human beings. If you take your time, if you, if you study uh, how money works, you realize that money was a means of exchange, a medium of exchange invented by human beings. Back in the day, it was treated by butter. People take certain kind of good, goods that they perceive to be of certain value and exchange with a different set, set of goods that they perceive to be of equal value. And when the values of this were, one of the problems money came into place was that measuring the value was becoming a dif- difficult. And what people wanted, or they, and the exchange, the medium of exchange was becoming more difficult. So money came into place. This is just a, a tiny bit of how money works and, you know, this history of money, there's more into it. But just for the sake of our conversation, I'm just trying to help us have some con- context here. Right? So money came in for many many reasons, to, to make exchange of value easier for human beings. So money was invented by people. So when a Christian describes or defines blessing as money, they've been robbed. They've been defrauded. Amen. They have been defrauded. And this is, you know, and some people will be expecting money in the post, check in the post, when they're expecting the blessings of God. But such people... If they understand that God's blessing are spiritual, now I want to talk. I want to talk about blessing out of context here. I'm going to go into context because some of those blessings are actually stated in the Bible in this chapter, and some also in chapter two and many other things in the Bible. Now, when we say that everything physical takes its root or has its root in the spiritual, now God's blessing to a person is a gift. Humanly speaking, is the potential and the ability has given them, which most of the time cannot be seen tangibly. So instead of a Christian expecting check in the post, can they look inside of them, look at the abilities that God has given to them, look around them, what problems are around them that God wants them to solve, that people can pay them for. The job we do, we don't go to work to get paid. There's a value that you offer. There are problems you solve. Hence, they will not hire you. Do you know, it took me a long time to understand that. I just thought, you get a nice job, they pay you the salary, you go home, you do your work, you go back home. And when you have that mindset, you don't really improve yourself because you see yourself as an employee. I go to work, we've, we've done today's job, it's out of the way, I'm going back home. No, you are trading your life. You are losing your life. I don't want to say use. You are trading your life for money when you go to work. So you better ensure that what you're doing has is has a lot of value so that they can pay you serious money. You know, I realized recently that my salary can actually double if I can only learn a few and want some other skills that senior people have. So it's either I try to climb the career, climb the career ladder, or go way up, learn those skills, develop myself, get some results, and then my salary doubles. And like Seriously? I learned that from someone that I will, not, I will not tell you because it cost me about $200 to learn that. Praise God. So instead of expecting check in the post, men, f- friends, you are blessed. You are already blessed. The blessing is inside of you. See, everything you need to prosper is in you. Everything you need to succeed is in you. And I'm not speaking as a motivational speaker. I'm telling you, you are a blessed person. Seeing yourself as someone who is cursed or who is not blessed is one of the things hindering your financial prosperity. Because what you don't think is attainable, you cannot attempt to to achieve. What you don't think is attainable, you cannot attempt to achieve. Praise God. So Paul is saying here that God has blessed, not he will bless. Now, even God's blessing, as we're going to go into the next verse, it was even before you were born, Watch this. This verse of the Bible was written, were written before all of us were born. And the Bible says that God has blessed you and I. 
So what makes us think that God will bless us less or God will not bless us when we are born? After we have been given birth to, even when, even, <laughs> praise the Lord. He has blessed us. These blessings are in the heavenly places. They are in spiritual form. Amen. And, you know, Paul is saying here, you know, it is worthy of praising God, appreciating him because of these blessings. Right. Uh, let me go far further down. So one, th one thing I wrote down here is that God's blessings in Christ are not to be sought. They are to be discovered re and received by faith. God's blessings are not to be sought. Don't try to use money or one, one gimmicky thing to seek the blessing of God. No, you are, supposed to, you are supposed to discover it. Discover how much you have been blessed. Then find out how to receive it. And all you need to receive is by faith. But most of the time, we need to train our mind to believe that we are blessed. And most of the time, it will take a lot of effort. Until we learn to receive and, exp and, and be willing to experience the blessings of God in rea reality, we will not be able to enjoy it. Amen. Let's carry on. So I said all physical blessings have their roots in spiritual blessings. The natural world around us was created by a spiritual force, the words from the mouth of God. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I love this. Let's take it one after the other. Just as he chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Verse 3 talks about the fact that we are blessed in Christ Jesus. So now th this is the blessings of God. Verse 4 goes into some of the, of the blessings of God. So the Bible says we were chosen in Christ Jesus. So friends, even if you don't have parents, even if the entire world is rejecting you, even if the entire world says you are good for nothing, the Bible says that God chose you, that in Christ Jesus, God, that you are a chosen one of God in Christ Jesus. Do you know what it means to choose? It means to exercise your senses and make a decision. So to choose something means you look at many options and you decide to go for a particular option. So you are so precious to God. And you need to understand that you are precious to God. God is not careless about you. He is decisive about you. He is intentional about you. Amen. God is very, very intentional about your life. So do, even if people see you as a non-entity, don't, uh, don't allow the devil to trick your mind into believing that. And I'm speaking to myself as well. I'm preaching this to myself nearly every day. I'm not there yet, but I've made good progress. Because the rejection of human beings has a, has a, huge, has a huge impact, negative impact on our lives. But we need to learn to understand that Someone who is bigger and, and greater than man, someone who created human beings, is so carefully intentional about our lives. So how human beings tend to treat us should not really bother us. But I would say, how human beings treat you will affect you or, and ultimately affect how you see yourselves. So if you know some people in your life are very, are very toxic, right? you need to start managing those relationships, including your parent. If your parents are very toxic, and evil because of the association or their upbringing, you need to manage your relationship with them. What's the point? You allow your parents to destroy, to ruin your life. And after they are gone, you are, you, you, you are kind of useless. You love them, you care about them, but you manage their contact with you. You love them from afar. It may sound painful, but it is the truth. I am telling you the truth. Because whatever evil and toxicity they pour into you, whether you like it or not, is what you will pour into your children. Now, where you, receive, where you are likely to receive toxic, toxicity the most is from the people that you are vulnerable with habitually. The impact, of, don't, don't ever think or underestimate the, the influence your parents or your loved ones can have on you. Remember Apostle Paul said in the book of First, uh, Corinthians 5, 9-11, he said, anyone named a brother or sister who is given to sexual immorality, he said, avoid them. And Paul was even saying to you that it's, it is safer, in my own word, it is safer for you to kind of keep reasonable um, relationship 
with people outside of the world, unsaved people, than to keep company with a believer who is given to sexual immorality. You know why? Because have you noticed that we are most vulnerable, not most, we are more vulnerable in church than we are when we are with people outside the world, depending on your level of faith and, and how committed you are to your Christian faith. When I'm in a workplace, when I go to certain places, when I go to pub with unsaved people, my guts uncon- unconsciously up because I know I'm a different breed. I know I'm a light of the world. I know I'm called to shine light, to be a blessing. But in church, oh, Mrs. T, oh, Mrs. Jones, oh, then you follow, they're, they're not in this church because all of them have left because when they come in, they realize that they don't have a place to, to, to stay here so they get out, right? So, but these people that, a few that have left, those who have given to sexual immorality, not many like that, maybe one or two, right? If you follow such people home, Right, because you see how lovely we are in church. You know, we open, we we open, we are honest because honesty is one of our um, watchwords, so to say. And you follow them home because your guts are down around this person. When they begin to manifest their sexual immorality, you know, kind of stuff, it will affect you. You begin to see it as okay. It's only a matter of time. So I'm saying to you that people who you are constantly vulnerable with are the ones that are most likely going to impact you. So be mindful of the people you, you, you hang around. I mean, be mindful of the people you hang around, what they tell you, what they do. Be, be very, very careful. Praise God. So the Bible says God chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Before you were born, before the world was created. He chose you, thinking about you. You know, it has a purpose for you. Now, so the, the, the word, the verb are chosen is from the Greek word called kaleo. Excuse me. And this means call out. So God calls, called us out in Christ to be holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. It means that our holiness in this context is not on the basis of our merit. Amen. Praise the Lord. My time is up. Oh Lord, can I do this? I don't want to rush it. Okay, let, let, let me let, let's okay, let me f- pick a few lines and then um, I'll shut down here. So the Bible says that so just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blame and without blame before Him in law. And I was talking about saints earlier on. Uh, that you know we are saints by position in Christ Jesus, and the Bible is saying to us here that God chose you in Christ Jesus to be holy. So God has designed it. I'm going to come that in verse 5. God has designed that before the foundation of the world, before the world was created, if you come into Christ, you, you receive automatic, indefinite holiness by position. Amen. So let me stop there. I'll continue from there next week and we're going to verse 5. Hopefully we're able to reach verse 8 next week and let's see how long God leads us. Amen. Um, there's a way to teach the book of Ephesians. I can just walk, walk you through this theologically. But if it's not applicable to your life, I don't really think church is worth coming because as a pastor, whatever I teach you on Sunday, as I give you theology, I should also show you how it applies to your life. So only God knows when we're going to finish this. But please take your note. By the time we finish this series, maybe in two years' time, I'm joking, right? I, I, I want to, like, I'm, I'm expecting you guys to have a long note. You know, you, you, should have a, you, should, you should have your own version of the book of Ephesians with commentary. Amen. And if you want to sell the commentary, let me know. I can be your publisher. And then we talk about my commission. Praise God. I'm joking. <laughs> Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that's come to us. And Lord, we pray that, you know, that this word uh, find a place in our heart. That we know that we are holy. That we know that we are chosen. I pray for us that our eyes of understanding will be much more enlightened. That we will see how precious and special we are to you. In the name of Jesus, so that we can act and live our life as special people and not as paupers, not as non-entities, not as insignificant people. Because we are very and highly significant to you. Hence, you chose us in you, in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Right, so let's...